Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Yasmin Cheyenne, who's here to share with us her new book, The Sugar Jar. Create boundaries, embrace self-healing, and enjoy the sweet things in life. So welcome to the show, Yasmin Cheyenne. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness, what an honor it is to have you here. And to talk about this book, what inspired you to write this? Yeah, I was definitely in a place of true turmoil because I had just given birth to my daughter and I had a really cocooned maternity leave and I just started working again. My my business was taking off. I had, I would say, all the things that I thought I needed to be happy you know, my my second child, my rainbow baby, my business taking off, career, friends, and I was overwhelmed. And so I started voice noting a friend saying that I felt like sugar in a jar, that people were just coming into my kitchen to get the sweet parts of me and that there was nothing left for me. And that moment of like real life desperation of texting a friend and feeling overwhelmed kind of started my journey of the sugar jar and inspired me to write this book. Well, I love how you talk about the experience of being in the kitchen, and it really relates to what the sugar jar meets for each of us. And I, I know so many women feel overwhelmed and depleted, and they just, they just can't add one more thing to their to-do list. Absolutely, because I feel like we wear so many hats, and societally, women are given so much pressure to do it perfectly. I'm a recovering perfectionist myself. Um to be everyone's, the best friend you could be, the best mom you could be, the best wife you can be. And that is a recipe for burnout. That is a recipe for being drained. It's also a recipe for resentment, anger, projection, exhaustion. So a lot of times we think, oh, I just need to go on a vacation and things will feel better. Or I just need a few days off, or maybe I'll just sleep in today. It's like, no, we need to really check in and ask ourselves, how am I saying yes to things in my life or people in my life or commitments in my life that aren't serving me? And how can I learn to prioritize myself? Because I think that's one of the hardest things for most of us to do, to make ourselves a priority, because there's such a connotation of it being a selfish thing to do. And that sounds so cliche because we always say that self-care isn't selfish, but truly it's hard for most people to embody that and actually put themselves first. So why do you think that is? I think a few things. Um, I think the first thing is no one wants to be called selfish or seen as selfish or seen as someone who isn't doing what perhaps their family, friends, culture, how they say being a good friend or a good parent or a good mom or a good sister should be. I think also a lot of people don't know how to do it. Um, I know for me, I wasn't taught how to prioritize myself. It wasn't that I was taught to necessarily be completely, to never put myself first at all, but I saw the people in my family, I saw friends, I saw on TV, the women always in a place of service and people always serving. And so I think when we ingest what we see around us in that way and we think, oh, this is the this is the only way to have a good life or a successful life or, you know, it also matters to some of us to be in a place of service. But, and I'm not saying don't serve, don't take care of the people you love. I'm saying take care of you too. And I think, I think it's a good question for people to ask themselves and to get curious around why am I always struggling to prioritize myself? And what is the story I tell myself about myself when I do put myself first and beginning to unpack? how I'm sure that story isn't actually a true representation of who you are and how prioritizing yourself can actually help you be able to show up better in your life with your friends, with your family, with the things, people, and places you care about. Do you mind sharing the story of the sugar jar, like how that came to be something relative for you? Yeah. I mean, as I shared um, earlier, when I was in my kitchen and that happened to me, the feeling of feeling like, I had so much energy being taken and I had so much being 
poured out of me. I mean, my story at that time was people are taking from me. People are coming into my kitchen. They're taking from me. They don't care. Um, That was my story. And eventually I realized, yes, people are taking, but I'm also giving. I'm also saying yes. I'm also participating in this cycle of giving more than I have. And I think when I realized that the sugar jar was such an easy way to check in with yourself, it's not easy to create the change necessarily. It's not easy to make the steps and take the action to create those boundaries and to say no, but it was a way for me to be able to check in with myself. And it was also a great way for me to teach my clients and to teach in workshops and to share with people how they could begin to make those actual changes in real ways. And so if the simple stopping point of asking, do I have enough energy to give to this? And then looking at your visual sugar jar, your uh, energetic sugar jar or imaginative sugar jar and saying, no, I'm pretty close to empty. I don't have it. If that helps somebody be able to set that boundary or it, it helps somebody be able to finally choose themselves, then I thought I have to continue to explore this and see how I can make it into something that people can carry with them, which is what the book became. And when you talk about don't have it, it could be resources, sleep, um, time, Mm -hmm. any of those kind of things. And I think a lot of times people don't even realize that those are something that they really should be paying attention to. Absolutely. Because I think people think life is just happening and we're just a part of it. And I don't think people always feel like they have the time to slow down and ask themselves, did I have enough rest today? Did I have enough water today? Have I seen the sun this week? Have I been outside? Have I had fresh air? Have I done anything that didn't require me running an errand? I don't think we're often doing that. I think we're just trying to survive adulting. We're just trying to survive uh, taking care of ourselves the best that we can. And that's why I love the idea of the sugar jar being that check-in to say, how can I pour into myself? I know all of the ways that I'm constantly giving. I know all of the ways that I'm constantly showing up for everyone else in my life. Well, how can I also fill myself up? And yes, self-care is a part of that, but a, another large part of filling ourselves up and maintaining the energy we have is truly ensuring that the commitments that we say yes to, the people we have in our lives, the friendships, the relationships, that they actually align with what we say we want for our lives. So for example, if you say, I really want a life with more peace peace and more ease, but all of your friends are constantly (laughs) involved in tumultuous drama, then you have to ask yourself, is the relationships I have actually a reflection of what I say I want? And I think it's important to mention that you don't have to end all of your relationships. You don't have to write people off because they don't match what you want in your life, in your life. But you do have to ask yourself, how much do I need to be involved with what they are choosing for themselves? How much do I need to be involved in those text messages, involved involved in those conversations? Do I need to be, you know, completely investing my energy? in these situations that I know are going to drain me. And that's just an example. But I think for a lot of us, for most of us, we have that person in our life that we love, but they sometimes bring a lot of the drama or a lot of the um, the overwhelm or the exhaustion. And we love them and we can love them and have boundaries. We can love them and prioritize ourselves. And so I shared that as an example, but I think it's just a testament to the fact that we, when we really choose ourselves, we do have to make tough decisions. We do sometimes have to say no to things that may disappoint people that may be different than what we would normally choose. And that's the tough part about prioritizing yourself and advocating for yourself. But we have to ask ourselves the question, am I only here to ensure the people I love and care about are comfortable? Is being there for them and their comfort worth the self-betrayal of not being there for myself? How can I truly ensure that 
I'm showing up for myself and caring about myself in the same ways that I show up and care about everyone else and all of the other things that I'm committed committed to in my life. Are there ways that people can start developing their boundaries? Like what would you suggest for people who are, you know, people pleasers and boundaries are really new? How would they even start? Yeah, that's a good question because I think um, a lot of my work helps people pleasers. I'm a recovering people pleaser too. And I think, you know, when we think about the sugar jar, the jar is the glass jar itself is you, right? It's your, the vessel, your body. The sugar is your energy. It is anything that you exchange. It is money, time, resources. Um, When people say, can I pick your brain? It's all of that. It's your information. It's it's your connections. And so people want access to that, right? That's those sweet parts of you. And to keep them from having access, you have a lid on and the lid is the boundaries. When we want to say yes, we take the lid off and they have access. When we want to say no, we keep the lid on. And unfortunately, the absence of boundaries is yes for most people. If you don't say no, they think you mean yes. And so being very clear about what we want is the first stop for people who are people pleasers or feel like they have a hard time saying no because Sometimes we're saying yes because we just believe that's what we that's the only option we have and that's what we quote unquote should do. So before you say yes to anything, I always recommend to people say, let me get back to you and take 24 hours to ask yourself and to think about do I one have space for this? Two, do I want to do this? Even if I do have space, even if I do have free time, do I actually want to do this? And once you ask yourself those those questions, then come back with an honest answer. And the truth is, one, people who love you, care about you, respect you, see you, will be happy that you chose yourself. They still might be disappointed that you said no. But the people who are angry, that are volatile, that are mean, you know, when we start really setting boundaries, we may realize that a lot of our relationships only existed because we didn't have boundaries, especially for those of us who are recovering people pleasers or recovering from codependency um, and other unhealthy relationships. And so doing that check-in really begins to create that relationship with ourselves of building the self-trust that I am on my side. I know what I need. And then the most powerful part, I'm able to ask for it. And then I'm able to deal with the tough part of sometimes when people are disappointed by the choices I've made. And I think that that's a great place for people to start because there's so many tools, there's so many resources when it comes to boundaries and learning how to be there for ourselves and learning how to advocate for ourselves. But that 24-hour check-in point with ourselves is, is so powerful. I can understand why, you know, while some people might not identify as a people pleaser, sometimes folks feel obligated to do certain things and they may not want to do it. So having that time's just such a resource. Absolutely. Because unless it's an emergency, why do we even feel like we have to answer people within five minutes that we have to give them an answer immediately? And even if you're not a recovering people pleaser and you don't connect to that language or you don't feel like you're a people pleaser, but maybe you're just learning to set boundaries, really asking yourself, why do I always feel that I have to give people an answer that would be something that they would want for me to say? Why am I not giving people answers based on what I actually want, need, desire, what I'm actually interested in? Curiosity is such a powerful tool when it comes to healing because curiosity leads to honesty. And we want to be as compassionately honest with ourselves as we can. We don't want to shame ourselves. There may be shame and guilt that comes up when we start to realize some of the unhealthy patterns that we have. But remembering that every single one of us are learning how to advocate for ourselves. We're all learning how to be there for ourselves. We're all still learning how to set boundaries. 
I teach boundaries and there are times where I have to set one where I'm still like, oh, this is going to sting because I know this is going to disappoint that person. And that's the work is being able to be as honest as we can, as compassionately honest as we can, while also still being truthful to the reality of what we can actually sign up for. Where is an area that you think people mostly get stuck when it's in regards to creating boundaries? I think people get stuck when it comes to the guilt that comes with setting boundaries. I think people are like, I hear you, Yasmin. That sounds great. And I feel like crap because I just disappointed someone I love and they're upset with me. And I don't think that that's what a good friend does, or I don't think that's what a good daughter does, et cetera. That's the hardest part because that's part of the hardest part. But I think that's the part that people get definitely stuck with because the disappointment that we feel when we set boundaries is tough and the guilt that comes up is tough. But I always ask people to ask themselves, is that guilt worse then saying yes and then being committed to something that you don't want to be a part of because it builds resentment. It builds projection. It, pr- it builds anger. And sometimes we're being, yes, you're present with the person. Yes, you said yes to help them with the thing. Or yes, you said you'd stay late at work even though you, you're exhausted. And yes, you may have you may not be disappointing them. But I'm sure there's energetic and potentially even verbal volatility coming from you, projection, because you have said yes to something you don't want to do. And now they are in your mind and in our, in our energy sometimes, we are solely blaming them. You're the reason why I'm here. You're the reason why I have to do this. And through, you know, compassionate self-accountability, I like to redirect towards, no, you are the one who said yes. They did not make you come here. They did not make you do this. And so I say all of that to say, I think guilt is the thing that often gets us really caught up in in putting ourselves out there and being honest. But if we don't, if we're not honest, then how do we show up? We're not showing up as our full selves. We're not showing up with the full yes. We're showing up reluctantly, often, resentfully, exhausted, and they're getting a version of us that. I know I wouldn't want to receive. I want you to tell me no so that I can ask someone else who's actually interested versus you saying yes and me thinking that you actually want to be here when it turns out that yes, you're here, but energetically, it's obvious you don't want to be here. And so learning that that guilt you feel, yes, it's not comfortable, but it's going to dissipate and is a better choice than saying yes or doing the things and always being the strong, reliable, available person to everyone, even though you don't want to be doing that. It is such a healthier choice, not only for yourself, but for all of your relationships. And it helps people to be able to trust that when you say yes, that you actually want to be here versus because people know they may not tell you because who would want to say, hey, I know you say yes, and you don't really want to do it. But people can tell you don't want to actually be around. Um, And it really creates just so much self-trust, which I think is something that also we struggle with. It sounds like that is such a a big thing. I can see that too, as I look at my own life and Mm -hmm. how how do we get to this place (laughs) where we have fullness of our jar and what would that look like? I love that question because surprisingly, I don't get asked that a lot. And I think that it's important to say that I don't think we ever get a full jar. I think the only people who walk around with full jars are children (laughs) because the parents are responsible for filling their jars and making sure that they have everything that they need. I also think that not all children, but overwhelmingly children are the only little humans in society who are able to like be pretty honest without suffering the totality of consequences in relationships. Yes, they might get in trouble for saying something wrong or, you know, they might get something taken away, um, but they probably won't have to have a tough conversation about throwing a toy on the ground because they didn't really want to, you know, clean up when it was time to go to bed. 
But in adult conversation and adult relationships, if you throw a tantrum, you know, get get upset, yell and slam the door, you're going to have to have a tough conversation later about your behavior. You may even lose the relationship. There are more severe consequences. So when we think about, you know, a child not having those same severe consequences and we think about ourselves as adults in relationship and we are going to have to have a tough conversation if we do something like throw a tantrum and yell and slam a door when we're having a conversation with someone, we're going to be responsible for our for how we showed up in that relationship. The children, eh, yes, they might get in trouble, but ultimately we're responsible for, for making sure they have everything they need to be full. As adults, it's hard to be full because adulting is tough. You don't know when the next bill's coming. You don't know what the next phone call is going to be. You don't know when your boss is going to come with some hard information. You don't know when your friends are going to find out she's getting divorced. You don't. There's so much happening, and there's so many things. Whether you have children or not, whether you're partnered or not, there's so many things coming at us as adults that we could wake up feeling refreshed and by 10 a.m. get information that just completely derails us and drains us in that moment. And so I don't think our job is to ensure that we are full. I think our job is to ensure that we learn what level am I at when I am feeling my best. For some of us, we could be at halfway full, you know, in terms of I have a lot on my plate, but I made time to eat. I made time to drink water. I got some pretty good rest and I'm going to do the best that I can today, but I'm overwhelmed. We have to learn our cues. When am I going to tip the jar to the point where I'm going to have so much going out that I'm not going to be able to keep up with filling myself up? And that's our goal to ensure that we don't want to be like when you think of I Love Lucy and the chocolates and they're like taking the chocolates off the conveyor belt um, and then all of a sudden it speeds up and they can't keep up and they're stuffing them everywhere. That's how, kind of how we can be sometimes. Our lives are so overwhelmed that we can't keep up with the amount that's coming in and we have to learn how to slow it down. When we learn to do this slow down, does that also help us with any kind of emotional charge we'll have to any of the information we get during the day? Absolutely. Because when we are moving, 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 we don't have time to check in with ourselves. We don't have time to check in with our emotions. We don't even know how we feel a lot of the time because we're just going versus having those moments where we say, because the check-in, do I have space for this before you say yes to something is an emotional check-in. Yes. Do I have space? And then do I want to do this? Does this feel good? Does this feel aligned? Those check-ins help you learn how to connect to, this is probably the number one question I get in terms of intuition and discernment. How do I know how I feel or what I want? When we stop to check in with ourselves and ask, what do I want and how will I feel if I say yes to this? If we don't know what we want or how we feel, and perhaps we say yes, asking, how do I feel now that I've said yes and I did this? did this feel good? Do I want more of this? Or did this not feel good? And I would like to not repeat this. Sometimes we do only learn what we want afterwards and that's okay. And I think for a lot of adults, um, when it comes to slowing down and just learning how we, how we feel and how to slow down and when to slow down, there's this feeling of, why don't I know what to do? And why is this so new to me because I think a lot of people feel like I've wasted so much time. I'm too old now and I could have done this seven years ago, or I may not have had children if I knew this, or I may not have gotten married, or, you know, there's so much regret and so much fear of it being too late that I think also gets in the way of slowing down and and making those different decisions because they're like, well, I'm here now. I might as well just keep going. I don't know what will change. And I don't know if I'm willing to. And it's tough. But I think recognizing that no matter how old you are, you are not too late. That's the first thing. If you decide to make changes today and you are 85 years old, <laughs> you're not too late. It Yes, we all would like to know this information from the time that we grew up. And unfortunately, <laughs> We don't come with uh, instructions. Parents don't get this information. And the parents we get are doing the best they can with what they have, even though sometimes it's not healthy, right? Um, and so 
learning how to parent ourselves is the unfortunate work for many of us. And when we think about ourselves as a parent for ourselves and we think about if I was taking care of me, little me who still lives within me, how would I give myself rest when I know I'm burnt out? How would I treat me if I was taking care of little me when I know I don't want to be in this relationship anymore or I don't want to be in this friendship anymore or I do want to tell them I love them and care about them and I want to connect? What would I, what would I tell myself? And it helps us to really sometimes gain the strength to realize, I, you know, I'm not too late because little me still lives in me. I'm not too late because I know slowing down will help me be able to live my life in a way that feels aligned, that feels good, that doesn't feel like every day is just the same, you know, very grounds, groundhog day um, experience. And it doesn't mean I'll have joy all day, every day. It doesn't mean I'll have peace in a drama-free life. I wish that was true. It's unfortunately not. But it does mean when the tough times come, when the drama comes, when I feel myself being overwhelmed, I at least know that I have a choice to choose something different and I can take care of myself. And that's something that so many of us don't feel like we have permission to do. Isn't that the truth? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, I mean, I think everyone listening could probably identify to this, you know, in one one uh, way or another, because there's just so much that we tend to pile on without even mm-hmm. occur, you know, having it occur to us that, gosh, you know, do I even want to do this? Does this even fulfill me? Mm-hmm. I mean, no one ever says, hey, can you help me move this weekend? And if you don't really want to do it, please let me know. No, it's usually <laughs> I need help you know, I asked you because you're the, you know, I trust you and, you know, it's tough We're in this, in the, in the small ways. And then even in the big ways when we are, you know, I can't not be in relationship with my parent, even though my parent is unhealthy because they're all, I'm all they have. Whatever the story is, we're telling ourselves about why we have to continue to do it. I'm encouraging you to ask yourself, okay, maybe you don't have, you're not in a situation where you want to leave the relationship. Got it. However, how can you be in relationship? How can you be in connection? How can you be committed to this and be boundaried? There's always a middle place. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. We can find ways to protect ourselves. For for example, Some people realize that when it comes to parental relationships that are unhealthy, they only feel comfortable and safe being around them when other people in the family are around them because maybe the parent doesn't say the things or do the things in the same way they do when they're alone. So that's a boundary. It may feel like it may be hard because we tell ourselves, well, I see other people with their family and their parents and they look so great and they look so happy and Maybe they'll change and maybe they'll shift and things can always, you know, I say this to say a lot of us are telling ourselves the fantasy of what what, what could be. We're still holding out hope that if we just continue and say yes, maybe at some point things will change. And for a lot of us, we're like, I've put in so much work in this relationship. If they change, I want to be the one that's on the receiving end. I do, I do not want to be you know, leave. And then the moment they change, somebody else gets the benefit of it. There's so much because we invest so much time and energy into folks and into into places, even businesses. There are business owners who are probably listening. And I know for a fact, there are people that are in business and they're like, I don't want to leave this business, even though it's not working because I've put in too much now and I'm afraid to walk away. I'm afraid to lose. And we have to ask ourselves, aren't we already losing? Haven't you already lost a lot of your energy? And not in terms of the fact that you've lost and you can't regain. We can always fill ourselves back up. But if you're already draining, if you you already have evidence of the fact that this isn't working, then the truth is what you're afraid of is a reality. So then what changes do you need to make to shift the reality so that you actually feel comfortable and safe how you decide to move forward? And this is tough. Who wants to admit to themselves, my marriage isn't working? Who wants to admit to themselves, my 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 father is 
an unhealthy person to be around? Who wants to admit to themselves, you know, these are the friends that I've chosen and they make jokes that make me feel uncomfortable and this, but they're all I have. It's incredibly painful to be honest sometimes about why we're drained in our lives and who's draining us and recognizing too that the tough conversation that we need to have with these folks, we may not be able to have because there may not be people who are on their own journey. And so therefore the conversation is going to go nowhere because they are not safe people to have those conversations with. Because we want to make sure that when we're having those tough conversations in terms of healing, that we're doing it with people who are going to be able to hear us, see us, respect us. So a lot of people we are grieving and losing and letting go of and changing our relationship with them without even ever having the closure, which a lot of times closure is code for holding on. (laughs) It's not really closing the door. It's, I want to hopefully open the door back up. But I know I just said a lot, but I think it's important to name all of those because this isn't just about how to say no to a party invitation, which again, that's a huge thing. People don't even know how to like, oh, I got invited to the wedding. I have to go. So we do have those moments, but it's also the tough, painful moments that we don't share with anyone else and that we hide even from ourselves because admitting it means the the dissipation of a fantasy life that may never happen. And we're holding space for something that is through evidence and action from the people that we're in relationship with or the commitments we're in, like a business, that it's not possible. And we're drained sometimes solely from our inability to admit the truth. And this is why I think self-healing is so powerful because this is work that we can begin to do alone so that when we do go to therapy, if we do that, or if we do go to our coaching sessions or our spiritual healers, we're bringing our truth as best we can versus the story that we're telling ourselves that's not even real. I love that. That is so powerful because isn't that the truth? We all have stories about our lives, our relationships. How do we get to this point where we can really see them for what they are? Ooh, I think this is the tough, this is another tough part. I feel like I'm always like, this is the tough part, but it's, it's a lot of tough parts. Acceptance is tough because acceptance requires looking at their actions and not what they say or not what you think they could be capable of one day. And if you see someone, if you're with someone, this could be a partnership, this could be a family relationship, this could even be business. But if you've asked someone, hey, this is what I need from you, this is how I need you to show up. And they say, I got I got it. I understand. Um, I'm going to support you. But the support never comes. Through their actions, they have shown you that either A, they don't, they're not interested in showing up. B, they don't have the capacity. Some people just do not have the space. Or C, maybe they have the capacity, maybe they want to show up, but it's not a priority. And We have to be willing to make decisions based on what is happening in front of us. You know, a lot of people may be listening and thinking, okay, so what do we do next? Do I just have another tough conversation? And, you know, sometimes we have many, 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 many tough conversations, but then you get to a place where you ask yourself, am I having conversations that are leading to actionable change or is my energy now going towards anger saying the same thing repetitively and getting nothing out of it because I'm unwilling to look at the fact that, yes, this person may be giving me lip service and saying that they want to be present or saying that they want to be here. But genuinely, if I looked at their actions, then I would already have the answer. So is a conversation needed? Sometimes people truly don't understand. And you may look at their actions and say, I can see this person cares for me. And I can also see that they don't understand how to show up for me. And so I'm willing to keep having that conversation. Great. But the people who are showing you that they are not interested in learning more, doing more, unpacking, discovering more, 
that's when we have to make a, a tough decision. Again, I'm not telling you that you have to leave these relationships, but I am telling you that learning more about how these relationships are impacting you may require you to set boundaries about how you show up in these relationships or the access that they have to you. So that's the starting point for being able to accept, looking at their actions, looking at how they are consistently showing up and not who you think they are, not who they used to be when they were younger or, you know, what you both dreamed about. Those things are great. And those things are still not what they do when they're with you or how you both commit to each other, whether it be platonic, business, romantic, familial, no matter the relationship. I think it's so important to take that inventory. So you kind of, you really know where you're at with people and have a clear understanding to what to expect from them. And, you know, I think a lot of times after reading your book, what I got is a lot of times people have these high expectations that are probably unrealistic for a relationship. Absolutely. Especially parental relationships and romantic, really actually all relationships, but if we just start with parental relationships. The story is usually, well, they're my parent. They should know. They should do. They should be. We should be the Hallmark commercial with the two, with the mom and the daughter laughing. We should be, you know, the dad and the son, you know, playing catch. I mean, your dad may have been a dad who didn't have a dad who knew how to play sports. And so you don't have the dad that knows how to play catch. Sometimes we have to give grace to the fact that our parents do not get an instruction manual for what we may need. And especially for the millennials and the Gen Z folks, the stuff we talk about today, no one was talking about this. No one was talking about this 15 years ago. So these conversations weren't happening and parents didn't have the support to be able to emotionally support their kids in the way that we are today. Not everyone anyway. I know some people did. I'm not speaking, you know, but just overwhelmingly societally, culturally, this was not a part of the conversation. And so, yes, giving grace to that. But, and also asking yourself, am I asking, am I expecting something from my parent that I know that they're not able to give? Have I talked to them about it? Are they a safe person to talk to? Because the truth is sometimes even our parents aren't safe folks to have conversations with. So have I tried to talk to them about it? Have I expressed how I feel? And this keeps happening. If this keeps happening, whether it's a parent or not, we have to ask ourselves, how can I make sure that I feel safe? And especially too in romantic or familial uh, or or friendships in romantic relationships or in friendships, You know, these are people that we choose. Our family, we're just born into it. And so sometimes we may feel like I have to make this work. And I encourage people to still be curious about how we can set relationships with family because we do not have to suffer through just because people are our blood relatives. That is just not the case. I know it's tough to set boundaries with the family. I know it's tough because we get so much feedback from people based on what they think we should or should not be saying or doing. But I think it's important to still, um, advocate for ourselves in romantic and in 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 romantic and friendship relationships it's also important to ask ourselves okay i chose this person meaning they're in my life by choice um and i'm asking them for support i'm asking them for communication i'm asking them for whatever it is that you're asking them for and they're not doing that so that is when we have to take serious inventory on how am I a part of this cycle? And I think it's always, again, important and powerful to come back to self, not because we are to blame, but because we can only control ourselves. We cannot control what they are going to do, how they're going to move forward, but we can control how we show up. So if I know how I'm a part of the cycle in my romantic relationship or how I'm a part of the cycle in my friendship, I can begin to create changes in how I remove myself from this cycle. Unfortunately, sometimes when we remove ourselves from a cycle, for example, if I keep having the same fight in my romantic relationship and the next time that trigger happens and that fight's about to happen and I decide, you know what? I'm not going to participate in this fight. I have nothing to say. I know that this is a hook for the same fight. I'm going to back away. If we decide to do that, 
then we might see a shift in the relationship. Because this is tough, but sometimes relationships are truly just functioning for the drama. They're sometimes (laughs) truly just functioning for what we are doing for each other, even though it's unhealthy. It's it's unfortunate, but sometimes we get val we get a false sense of validation from negative attention. A lot of times people feel like people care, even if it's negative, even if it's from through a fight, even if it's because of how you argue and yell with yell yell at me and show up. Sometimes people feel like people care only when they're overfunctioning with us, only when they're overgiving only when they're participating from a place of perfection. And so when we begin to heal, when we begin to check ourselves and remove ourselves from that cycle, some of our relationships begin to, they they fall apart because the relationship could only exist, especially codependent relationships, could only exist if both parties are participating in the unhealthy cycle. So when people are healing and they say, oh, my relationships have changed. I looked around and found out I was alone. That is a really tough thing to happen. And that also might be reflective of the fact that a lot of your relationships were unhealthy ones that required you to be in that unhealthy space of not choosing yourself, of the cycles you were in, perhaps codependency, perhaps people pleasing, perhaps perfectionism or others. And now that you've left that cycle or now that you're no longer choosing those things, the relationship was solely built on that negativity. The relationship is now over because you're no longer participating. And so, yes, you may be lonely in the moment, but that doesn't mean you can't build new community and relationships based on what you know you need now. And so that was a really long answer for acceptance, but I feel like that is kind of the path of acceptance. Acceptance starts with once you know, it's hard to unknow. And then now I have to make a decision. And these are the potential repercussions of what can happen when I say yes to me. And that saying yes to ourselves, that's part of that creating boundaries, right? Absolutely. Because once I create that space of acceptance, then the boundaries come. And once I start to create the boundaries, the boundaries are going to be based not only on what I want in this relationship, but they're also going to be based on what makes me feel safe, what makes me feel cared for, what I need. And I think it's important to share too, boundaries are not ultimatums. They're not you do this or else. Boundaries are an opportunity to understand each other and to compromise from a safe place. But it doesn't mean that boundaries are a debate, that we get to debate what boundaries I should or should not have. So In healthy relationships, boundaries do create space for conversation and understanding. Um, But in unhealthy relationships, a lot of time boundaries are, this is just a no. I'm not doing this with you anymore. We're not having this conversation anymore. You can't say that to me anymore. This is how I need to be respected. And yeah, not everybody responds well to being asked to show up in a healthy way. And that is what choosing yourself is, setting the boundary anyway even though the person may decide to walk away. You're saying, I'm more important than staying in this unhealthy space with them. Do you find that when we do that, the relationships we're really looking for that match our boundaries end up showing up? Absolutely. I think first we find that there are people in our lives. Yes, we do lose a lot of folks sometimes, but we find people in our lives who are willing to meet us. Sometimes they're not the people we want because a lot of times we want the unavailable folks. We want the people who (laughs) have already shown us they're not even interested because they tend to have a a stronger gravitational pull on us, um, especially when we're in that unhealthy uh, space of choosing relationships that are not serving us. They tend to be the ones that get the greatest attention because they tend to be the ones that pull on our energy the most. When we let those relationships go and we have more spaciousness, we tend to find, oh, I did have some people in my life who I could trust, who I can, who care for me, who are interested in being in healthy relationships with me. And then we start, we tend to do things that we enjoy. Maybe we're not doing just the things that other people wanted us to do or the things that we thought we should be doing. We tend to start to do the things that we like and discover our own hobbies. And before you know it, Oh, I'm in this gardening class. I'm in this pottery class. I'm listening to this podcast. I'm going to this live podcast event. I'm making friends at these events. I'm connecting with like-minded people 
who are saying yes to me as me, not who I've been performing to be, not who I've been pretending to be, not necessarily on on purpose performing or pretending, but unconsciously being who we think we have to be to belong. No, now I'm being myself. And so when I connect with people, I'm connecting based on who I am and what I desire and what I need. And it's such an amazing thing to experience being in relationship based on who you are. And I think for those of us who are married and who have or partnered and have been in relationships a long time, I feel like we do this in relationship, in in marriage and in long-term partnership because we change, we grow, we heal, things happen. And to be in long-term partnership, we have to continue to choose ourselves, each other over and over again as we change, as we shift, as we grow, because we're not the same person we were when we met. And so it can happen in relationships that we're just meeting. And it also happens in long-term partnerships or long-term friendships. For my example, myself, I have a friend I've been friends with since junior year of high school. That was a long time ago. We're very different people today. We've had to choose to grow and respect each other and learn to be in relationship, even though we've changed. So how does forgiveness play a part in all of this? This is such a good question after everything we just talked about, because I think forgiveness is such a part of this part of the process. Because once we've accepted the things that have happened, we understand our boundaries, we understand what we need, we've started to set the boundaries, we start to gain the new community or build with healthier relationships with the people that we're going to be staying in connection with. There can be a lot of anger um, at others and at ourselves for the ways that, like, how could I have chosen this for myself? Why did I say yes to this? Why did I waste so much time doing this? So in in that way, we're learning to practice self-forgiveness. We're learning to say, you did the best you could. You know better now. And so you're no longer choosing that and focusing on the ways that you're moving forward. We're learning in in those circumstances how to love ourselves, even though we've made choices that we don't love now that we know the consequences of the choices that we didn't maybe fully understand then. Externally, we're also faced with, okay, I've accepted who this person is and can I forgive them? Can I move on? For a lot of us, this is the hardest part of the healing process because we don't, we struggle with moving past what happened. Sometimes we've been through things that we'll never forgive them for what happened. I think it's important to to share that forgiveness isn't a requirement. Forgiveness is a choice. So if you'd like to move toward forgiveness, external forgiveness with someone else, understanding that they may not be sorry for what they did is really hard and unfortunately a part of the pro- a part of the reality of it you may never get the apology that you deserve you may never get the apology that you hope for and i think that's why self forgiveness is so powerful in this process because we are showing ourselves the love the appreciation the grace that we may never get from other people yes there are times where we seek understanding we seek we seek for apology we seek for clarity and quote unquote closure and also i often feel that the closure that we're seeking and i shared this a little bit earlier but the closure that we're seeking with others and what we're hoping to gain from others is we want them to help us feel better about how we feel and that's not their work and even if they apologize the work to feel better, the work to heal, the work to have that self-forgiveness that helps us to feel supported and loved and able to move forward. It comes from us. It comes from the work that we do. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? Yes. Um, If you'd like to connect with me on a daily basis, I post every day on Instagram at Yasmin Cheyenne. You can get the Sugar Jar book everywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, or your favorite indie bookstore. And I have the Sugar Jar podcast and it's available everywhere podcasts are on Apple, on Google Play, 
and you can listen there as well. And what's your website? Uh, Yasminshyan.com. Well, Yasmin, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Yasmin. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The Sugar Jar. If you'd like to connect with Yasmin and learn more about her work, visit her website, yasminshyan.com. You can also purchase your copy of The Sugar Jar at the publisher, HarperCollins. Their website is harpercollins.com. Well, we're going to pause here for a quick moment. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after this message. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.